Um, hi, fellow astrologers. My name's Elaine, and I'm currently doing level two um, of the diploma at the faculty. In my presentation today, I'm going to give you an overview of my personal uh, journey with astrology. In particular, my grandfather was a purple star astrology reader. He was the one who first introduced me to the concept of looking to the heavens for our fate. My own love affair with astrology began when I met astrologers um, during my year out in Bali. As I'm training to be a psychotherapist, I will also ex explore from my perspective the pitfalls we need to be aware of as astrologers. I'll also discuss how astrology can be used um, psychospiritually to accelerate the process of Jungian individuation. Um, so my journey started when I was a young child in Singapore. My grandfather and granduncle were what we call in Chinese, um, the Wei Dou Shu, translated as purple star astrology readers. They read the charts of everyone in their family. And to me, the Wei Dou Shu seems a bit better for predicting concrete events. For instance, my grandfather knew he wouldn't live beyond 71 whereas modern um, Western astrology seems more psychological in its approach to me. Um, so Wei Shu has been used for more than a thousand years to determine one's destiny, and it's known as a personalized feng shui. In feng shui as well as Chinese medicine, there are five elements. Four are the same as what we have in Western astrology, fire, earth, air, and water. The fifth element is metal. Chinese astrology has always been closely intertwined with astronomy. During China's ancient dynasties, um, gifted astronomers and astrologers were recruited as officials to work in the imperial court. <coughs> they used the Wei Dou Shu to craft astrological charts for the emperor's exclusive and private consultation, as the emperor's destiny had a direct bearing on that of his dynasty. The court astrologers also play an important role in determining the successor to the throne. Among the many stars used in Zui Dou Shu, Chinese astronomers uh, noticed only one was stationary, while the rest seemed to revolve around it. This star, known in the West as Polaris, was also the brightest. It was named the Emperor Purple Star, uh, Zui Wei and it came to represent the celestial equivalent of the emperor. Zui Dou Shu approaches the world and events from the idea that to view things in their proper context, it is important to recognize the spiritual dynamic of the universe, to discover the underlying energetic patterns at play. Just as we do in modern Western astrology, knowledge about the likely energies to come may allow one, to gauge the situation and to make decisions from a position of strength. Um, so that's my chart. The easiest way, <laughs> the easiest way we can understand the Wei Dou Shu from a Western astrology perspective is to see it as a method of studying the six stars that uses a house system, much as we do in Western astrology, where each house represents a different area of life. You can see the 12 houses. Um, they also use a system of dignity and debility. It's too complex to go into here, and suffice to say that there are interesting parallels between my Zui chart and my Western uh, astrology chart. For instance, in my uh, natal Western chart, I have Jupiter in the eighth, and in my Zui chart, I have my Zui star representing, amongst other things, luck and prosperity in my property and inheritance house. Um, so having worked in the corporate world for a number of years and become thoroughly fed up of it, after I, last, I left my last corporate job, I went on a yoga retreat to Ubud, Bali. I'd originally only intended on staying a month, but ended up staying an entire year. Uh, much like Elizabeth Gilbert and Eat, Pray, Love, Bali became, well, the start of a very long love affair, which continues to Till this day. During that year, I met all kinds of healers and readers, deeper healers, holotropic breathwork practitioners, Native American shamanic uh, healers and readers, to name a few. Out of everything that uh, I came across, astrology really captivated my attention. Um, how could someone who barely knew me 
seem to have the lowdown on my story. Among the readers I knew in Bali, um, shamanic and evolutionary astrology seemed to be the most in vogue, a trend driven no doubt by astrologers such as Kaipacha, who my shamanic astrologer friends tell me is the black sheep of their family. Um, upon returning to the UK, I immediately signed up with the faculty. So, since psychotherapy is forming a major part of my topic, at this point I feel it might be interesting to examine my chart briefly to see if there might be indications for my suitability as a therapist, and feel free to disagree. Um, <laughs> you see firstly that despite my moon in Leo, um, I have three planets in Virgo, so it's extremely hard for me to stand before you today. Lindsay practically had to twist my arm for me to agree to give the presentation. Um, with such a packed eight house, I was always going to be drawn towards the areas of life, such as shared resources, primal patterns, the mysterious, inheritance, death, taxes and sex. Indeed, with Jupiter and Mars in the eight, I can definitely feel uh, in myself an energetic and fearless exploration of the darker sides of life. Um, at the very least, there is an intensity and engagement with these areas that most people shy away from. At the same time, with Mercury trying Pluto, this gives my thoughts and communications a depth and probing intensity, also making me direct and to the point. Um, Chiron is strongly represented in my chart. It is the focal planet of a fixed T-square with my sun and moon, and also at their midpoint. Chiron, the maverick healer and teacher, is in my fourth house, and the house of past family heritage, our parents, and uh, foundations of our private life. And lastly, my midheaven is in Scorpio, and Pluto is making a wide conjunction to this. I have moon in the seventh, so I'm much more comfortable in one-on-one -on -one interactions and tend to struggle in groups. Um, hopefully, this has given you a greater appreciation of my background. And I'll now come to the topic of where I see um, astrology fitting in with psychotherapy. So, there are many schools of psychology out there. However, the one for me that's the most relevant for astrology's purposes is transpersonal psychology. The definition by Kaplan that I have listed on this slide encapsulates its essential meaning. Transpersonal psychology is a school of psychology that integrates the spiritual and transcendent aspects of the human experience within the framework of modern psychology. <laughs> <laughs> it's also possible to define it as a spiritual psychology. The transpersonal can be defined as experiences in which the self the sense of identity or self extends beyond and therefore transcends the individual or the personal to encompass wider aspects of humankind, life, psyche or cosmos. Issues considered in transpersonal psychology include self beyond the ego, peak and mystical experiences, systemic trance, spiritual crises and evolution, religious perversion and altered states of consciousness. It attempts to describe and integrate spiritual experience within modern psychological theory and to formulate new theory to encompass such experience. Um, Roberto Arcegioli's psychosynthesis, the model that I'm training in, arguably falls under the transpersonal approach. Amongst other thinkers who set the stage for transpersonal include William James, Carl Jung and Abraham Maslow. Jung for me is the person most relevant for the purposes of astrology. Jung did not see human beings as purely biological or organisms in the way that Freud had, and nor was he interested only in treating neuroses and mental illness. Jung was fascinated by the spiritual aspects of the psyche. In fact, he saw what he called the numinous aspects of human uh, psychology, our individual connection to the divine, as holding the true key to therapy. Throughout his life, he had a fascination with exploring the esoteric and the paranormal, and he wrote an enormous amount about subjects relating to both areas. He had a wide range of interests, such as Gnosticism, um, alchemy, the I Ching, synchronicity, and astrology. He was particularly interested in astrology because it tied up with his ideas about archetypes, 
and the collective unconscious. Or maybe it was the other way around, and Jung was influenced by astrology to arrive at his theories. Um, I'm not really sure either way, but what we do know is that Jung was fascinated with astrology. He did a great deal of research, um, drawing up natal charts, finding out how they linked up with events in people's lives. He was fascinated by the idea that a person's private world was linked to far-reaching aspects of cosmic activity. He tried to use astrology to demonstrate synchronicity as a natural law in its own right. And he even studied the birth charts of married couples to see if the positions of the planets in the two natal charts um, corresponded with the actual marriage event. If this could be demonstrated, he would have established a causal link. He did not actually find a direct correlation, but what he did find was equally fascinating. He found that the results varied according to who was doing the actual analysis meaning a person's subjective expectations were somehow reflected in the results. Modern physics has demonstrated this, that the observer can affect the results of an experiment just by observing. So Jung's view of the human psyche reflected the ancient maxim as above, so below. For him, events in the outer material world were often reflected in the inner world of the psyche. This could also take place in reverse. With the, with the individual affecting their surroundings. Jung discovered that as patients got deeper into therapy, synchronous psychic events became more frequent in their lives. He concluded that an individual is not an isolated psyche, but part of a vast network of interacting energy. Since psyche and matter are part of the same unfathomable universe and in constant contact with each other, Jung thought it possible, if not probable, that they actually represented two aspects of a whole. And to me, psychotherapy and astrology go hand in hand. Um, while prominent astrologer psychotherapists such as Liz Green and several more have graced the faculty, a simple Google search reveals that there are many practicing astrologer psychotherapists out there. While there are fundamental differences between the two, there are similarities as well. Both deal with the psyche at different levels, yet both are dedicated to helping clients surmount the challenges of everyday living. Um, astrology is of immense value in the therapeutic process as it can accelerate the diagnostic phase, enhance empathy, and illuminate the path of healing. For me, astrology can be defined, divided into two main approaches, mundane as well as psychological astrology, I know there are several more, but these are just the two categories I'm talking about today. Um, to me, mundane astrologers provide practical guidance for everyday problems. Their focus is more educative, supportive, and directed towards limited concrete goals. For example, an orary astrologer may answer questions with regard to his client relationships. A predictive astrologer might advise his client with regard to the best time for taking a vacation. An election astrologer could counsel his client about optimal time for launching a new business. And stock market trends belong to financial astrologers, and business astrologers provide advice um, with regard to hiring employees, personnel decisions, expanding market share, and so on. Psychological astrologers, however, are interested in depth, unconscious processes, and the promotion of personality integration and transformation. A psychological astrologer is interested in how the chart depicts an individual's psychic structure and process. This is what is meant by psych psychodynamics, which refers to underlying drives, feelings, and beliefs. At the heart of a psychological approach is an emphasis on facilitating the client's growth. To me, the faculty is distinctly more psychological in its approach. Instead of focusing exclusively on outcomes, um, i.e. observable behavior and events, we explore how outcomes derive from deeper, unconscious, psychodynamic drives. We don't see behavior in terms of alleged uh, astrological causes. For instance, it's not Mercury's retrograde that caused me to miss my bus. Rather, we use astrology to understand and explain psychological processes that are regarded as the true cause of behavior and events. Using Jung's theory of synchronicity, or as above, so below, I believe what goes on in this earthly realm 
is but a microscopic reflection of what is actually going on in the wider macroscopic realm in our solar system. Above all, here at the faculty, we place responsibility for life experience with the individual rather than with presumed external causes originating in the planet. Our goal is to empower the client to take accountability for what he or she attracts and creates. While there are obvious differences between psychological astrology and psychotherapy, there are some similarities too. Both have similar goals and may use similar techniques. Um, for instance, both practices provide insight into unconscious belief and promote personality growth and healing, and each depends upon empathic confrontations and artful interpretations. The most obvious difference uh, for me between the two disciplines is the amount of time expended in the process. In the vast majority of cases, an astrology client will come for at the very most three or four sessions. There's only so much one can say about a chart before it starts to become repetitive. Psychotherapy, on the other hand, generally unfolds over a period of several months, two years, and focuses on supporting the client in the process of internal exploration and discovery. This highlights an essential difference between the psychological astrologer and the psychotherapist. The former uses astrology to clarify psychological issues and conflicts, whereas the latter uses psychotherapeutic techniques to resolve psychological issues and conflicts. Psychological astrologers recognize that transformation takes time, patience, and continual effort, thus, and this does not automatically follow an astrological revelation. Um, a good reader can provide insight into the nature of the client's difficulties while also inspiring hope and direction for future change. Weight is focused on the process of interpretation, making connections between the past and present, and disclosing how a person's inner beliefs are synchronistically reflected in outer experiences. <clears throat> on the other hand, psychotherapy is much better at supporting the transformation process especially during times of stress or crisis. Where this differs from psychological astrology is the emphasis that is placed on self-exploration and emotional release. In therapy, the process is one of the... Uh, the onus of responsibility is now on the client who engages in the process of introspection. The client's primary focus is on exploring feelings, worries, concerns, and conflicts, falling where they where they might lead. This necessarily requires a more supportive and receptive stance on the part of the therapist, who must not intrude with premature interpretations and quick fixes. If all goes well, the client will gradually feel safe enough to recall repressed memories and feelings associated with traumatic experiences that could have been too painful or frightening to face. Discovery of this sort has an entirely different quality from the insights that could derive from an astrological consultation. It is fuller, more three-dimensional, and it carries an emotional component that allows for deeper understanding, personality integration, and real healing. Obviously, working with this sort of material requires considerable training and expertise. Um, ethical issues arise when re clients request to be seen by astrologers for an extended period of time. Their motivation for seeking help might be due to a fear of formal counseling, the stigma that psychotherapy might entail, or the misguided perception that astrologers have the answers to all problems. However, once the process extends beyond interpretation of the client's chart, the astrologer may be unwittingly entering the field of psychotherapy. A client suffering from clinical depression, post-traumatic stress, personality disorder, or any number of other issues is best served by therapists who are trained to assess, diagnose, and treat such conditions. Unless the astrologer has also trained in therapeutic techniques and is licensed to practice psychotherapy, it would be unethical for astrologers to work with clients over an extended period of time, and it would be in the client's best interest to be referred on to a specialist who is trained and qualified. Again, the most obvious difference between astrology and psychotherapy is the amount of time expended in the process. 
Astrological work rarely extends beyond three to four sessions, whereas therapy can last from several months to years. There are other differences too. Astrological work may at times deviate from the chart and get into sensitive emotional areas with the client, but almost invariably it will circle back to the chart. Um, conversely, even for psychotherapists who use astrology, it would be quite rare for them to actually discuss the chart with the client. Rather, the chart is used as a diagnostic tool that accelerates insight and deepens empathy. The client benefits from the increased understanding that the chart affords the therapist. Reference to the chart is generally unnecessary, for it runs the risk of disrupting the client's inner process and shifting the focus to a heady intellectual realm. It is tempting to believe that astro astrologers, we can be all things for all people, but we can't. And we must always be on guard against the hubris that working with such a powerful tool can involve. While astrologers should not practice ongoing psychotherapy unless they have received the appropriate training, this doesn't prevent them from being sensitive, empathic, insightful, and so on. Um, the key word here is ongoing. So long as psychologically oriented astrologers do effective work with clients, they could be seduced into working with clients over an extended period of time that will go beyond their boundaries of competence. Financial incentives, not wanting to disappoint the client, ego gratification or God complex, and various other factors can all contribute to difficulties in establishing clear boundaries in this area. Um, having said all that, I do feel that there are areas where astrologers could learn from psychotherapists. Astrology is fascinating, it is technically complex, and it takes years to become a good astrologer. However, precisely because there is so much information to take on, astrology has been in, accused of being quite heavy, and as astrologers, we're said to be in our heads a lot. Maybe I shouldn't speak for others, but I know I certainly am. To me, there can be a tendency to forget that the person before us is a living, breathing human being with all their doubts, fears, and insecurities. We must never think that the chart is bigger than the person. Uh, for instance, someone with Chiron in the fourth conjunct the IC can have deeply embedded wounds and trauma around their father or family. In that case, it would be more important for me to be sensitive in my delivery than to ensure I get all my keywords for Chiron the IC and the fourth house out. Or put another way, imagine saying to a client, you've got a lack of water in your chart, you're not an emotional person. <laughs> not only is this inaccurate, it's also possibly dangerous. The client might develop a mental script that emotions aren't their thing and unconsciously continue to repress any that do come up. It's far better if we could say to them that they might find it more difficult to contact their emotions whilst gently encouraging them to do so. Another thing that astrologers could learn from psychotherapists is how to be in the here and now with a client. In our rush to read the chart and get all our points across, we should not forget to check in with ourselves in the here and now as we're sitting with the client. Typical points to consider include, are my palms sweaty? Are there physical sensations in my belly? Is that my anxiety or my clients. What am I picking up from this client? What's their mood like? What's the energy they're giving off? Are they nervous or fidgety? Do they seem uncomfortable? Um, is there something they're not telling me? And therefore perhaps implying they're not ready to go there. Are there any thoughts that are coming up for me? Am I being brought into my own childhood or history? What does or who does this person represent for me? Um, above all, I feel that as astrologers, we would do well to try to be aware of the stuff that is ours and the stuff that is the client's, and to be aware of when we might be projecting onto the client our own doubts, fears, and insecurities, and to be aware that the client might well be doing the same with us. Um, we'll now look at how astrology can enhance the process of individuation, but to do that, we need to first understand the concept of the self. Jung's thinking about the self and the process of individuation is what separates Jungian analytical psychology from other psychoanalytical schools. He uses the concept of the self to describe his understanding of who we are and the concept of individuation to describe 
how we can fulfill our potential to become all we can be. In the Freudian uh, Kleinian psychoanalytic tradition, the self is seen as a byproduct of ego development. By contrast, for Jung and for Asa Jolie, the self is, pre is present before the ego. It is primary, and it's the ego that develops from it. The self retains its mystery. We can never fully know it because we're dependent on the relatively inferior ego to perceive it. In contrast, Jung saw the self as many things, including psychic structure, developmental process, and an archetype in its own right. It has been depicted as the totality of body and mind, the God image, the union of opposites, and a dynamic force which pilots the individual on his or her journey through life. For Jung and Nasser Jolie, the self creates situations in our lives, spiritual emergencies, um, existential crises that lead us back to ourselves. But it's yet, this is yet another way that Jung departs from Freud, for even though other psychoanalysts have talked about the self in a similar way, Freudian psychoanalysis still largely sees the self as a structure within the mind. Jung saw individuation as the process of self-realization, discovery, and experience of meaning and purpose in life, the means by which we find ourselves and becoming who we really are. It depends upon the interplay and synthesis of opposites, conscious and unconscious, personal and collective, psyche and soma, um, divine and human, life and death. The concept of individuation, therefore, is the cornerstone of Jungian psychology. For me, the study and practice of astrology is able to enhance and accelerate the individuation process. Through coming to a greater understanding of their chart, the client is embarking upon a process of self-discovery, which will ultimately lead them back to themselves. It does this through a number of ways. Firstly, astrology is all about the interplay of opposites. Whether we're talking about the sun and moon representing consciousness and unconsciousness, or two opposing signs or houses, the concept of opposition permeates all of astrology. Challenging aspects, especially the opposition, are all about integrating two different and opposite planetary principles with opposing modes of expression and in opposing areas of our lives in order to arrive at a balanced and harmonious state of being. Secondly, astrology allows us to explore our shadow material and to work through um, this material. For instance, when we look at our moon representing our unconscious, the condition of our Pluto, the catalyst for deep and far-reaching transformation in our life, the condition of our Chiron representing the traumas and woundings we've had to work through in this life, the condition of our Saturn, our fears and inadequacies, to me, that is shining a light into the parts of ourselves we don't normally want others to see. Astrology is like a window into our soul. It sets out our fears, motivations, instincts, and impulses as a basic blueprint in this life, which we spend the rest of our lives resolving and working through. Lastly, astrology is instrumental in connecting us to our life purpose by looking at the condition of our sun what sign and house it's placed in, what aspects or aspect patterns it's making. We have a good feel for what we came here to do in this life. The lunar nodes are another indicator of our path of evolutionary growth, as well as the route that we take to get there. You're all familiar with the sun and nodes, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, in relation to life purpose, I have found Daniel Jamaro's shamanic astrology quite fascinating. It's similar to Jungian psychology in the sense that the bottom line is the quest for meaning and it's about describing the intent of the soul's journey. For them, just as the moon represents our psychic inheritance or the mystery school we have mastered in a previous life, the ascendant indicates the primary mystery school or tribe that we belong to in the current life. The directional flow of the soul's journey is towards the ascendant and it's almost always something quite new to the individual. Similarly, the house where our north node is located is known as our major or job in this life. And putting both together, there are 12 possible signs on the ascendant, so 12 different mystery schools or tribes, and 12 different houses 
that our north node can lie in. This gives a total of 144 possible storylines, and these storylines are referred to as the 12 jobs in the 12 tribes, or the 12 majors in the 12 mystery schools. For me, with a Capricorn ascendant and an 8th house placement of my north node, I have the Scorpio job in the Capricorn tribe, or the Scorpio major in the Capricorn mystery school. Shamanic astrology, therefore, offers us another perspective on our soul's journey, how we came to be here, our moon and a house placement on our south node will indicate that, and where we're going, for which we look at the ascendant or the house placement of our north node. Um, come to the end, thank you for letting me share my thoughts on astrology from a psychotherapeutic perspective, exploring where we're, we're going from here, as well as how we can use astrology to enhance greater self-understanding and awareness, ultimately facilitating the process of Jungian individuation.